Welcome to Smart Catalyst, dated October 25, 2018. So today we are going to see all these articles. The first one is CBI Chief Removal. The second one is Supreme Court Bans BS4 Vehicles by 2020. And the third one is Assessment of the Resilience of Terrestrial Ecosystem to Drought. And the fourth one is Cabinet Gives Permission for a panel set up to check whether the UN Sustainable Development Goals are on track or not. And fifth one is Cabinet Approval of establishing adjudicating authority as well as establishment of appellate tribunal for PBPT Act. And the next one is creation of FIDF fund. And the last article for prelims is MOU amongst BRICS nation. So the first article is CBI chief removal. So what the news here is the Central Bureau of Investigation chief is removed by the government by yesterday. So whether it is appropriate or whether it is legal or not, this is what the news is. Okay. So this article was taken from the Hindu newspaper. So to ensure the autonomy of the CBI, what we have to do is the Lokpal Act actually mandates that the appointment of the CBI director should be by a committee which is comprising of the Prime Minister, the CJI as well as the leader of opposition or the largest opposition party in the Lok Sabha. So this committee is responsible for the appointment of the CBI chief. So what the concern here is whether the leader of opposition or the CJI is called upon for such removal. So this is what the major concern. So the CBI director cannot be appointed or cannot be removed without the consent of this collegium which consists of the Prime Minister, the CJI as well as the leader of opposition. And also the CBI director can be removed on the grounds of misbehavior only by an order of the President after the suitable inquiry. So these are all the provisions which are mandated in the Lokpal Act. Okay. And also one more thing, the Supreme Court judgment in Vineet Narayan case, what they upheld was the tenure of the CBI chief is minimum of two years. So it is fixed, but it is also now violated. So these two are the major concerns. So now let's see about the CBI. So the CBI is an autonomous body which purpose is to inquire into the cases of corruption in the procurement Initially, it was established for the corruption cases in the procurement during the World War II. Okay? So it is under the name of Delhi Special Police Establishment in 1941 and later only it changed into the name CBI. Okay? So it is not a statutory body and it works under the overall superintendence of Central Vigilance Commission. And few more facts about CBI is it is headed by the director and assisted by the special director and or additional director okay so the cbi was set up in 1963 by the resolution of ministry of home affairs and later it transferred to ministry of personnel and now it is an autonomous body and the cbi's purpose is to provide the assistance to the central vigilance commission as well as for the lokpal so what is this cvc is central vigilance commission it is a apex vigilance institution which was established in the year 1964 and in 2003 it was converted to a statutory or it got the statutory body status. For investigating the corruption related cases among the senior federal civil servants at public sector bodies including the state owned banks. So for dealing all these cases the Central Vigilance Commission is only giving the instructions to the CBI. So the next article is Supreme Court bans sale of BS4 vehicles from 2020. So this article is also taken from the Hindu newspaper. So what the news here is the Supreme Court actually banned the sale and registration of the motor vehicles which is conforming to this BS4 norms in the entire country from April 1, 2020. So we have to know what this Bharat stage emission norms are. So these are the standards which is instituted by the government for all the motor vehicles or the automobiles. The purpose is to regulate the output of air pollutants from internal combustion engine equipments or the automobiles including the motor vehicles. So this BS emission norms is equivalent to the EU norms. Okay. So what the news here is the air pollutants whichever is released by the internal combustion equipments of the motor vehicles it contains very toxic substances such as the carbon monoxide and hydrocarbons nitrogen oxide and particulate matter so these all are present in both petrol as well as in the diesel engine emissions so what the government now trying to do is to reduce the level of all these component in the fuel as well as in the filtration process itself okay 
So if you see here, these are the various stages of uh, the BS norms. The first one is each and every stages differ only by means of the amount of these components present in that particular fuel released by the emission of these petrol or diesel engines. So now what needs to be done here is we have to upgrade from the BS4 to BS6 in terms of both fuel as well as in terms of technology. So for that what is new in BS6 is the SCR which is the selective catalytic reduction technology which is introduced in those engines and these what it will do is it will reduce the oxides of nitrogen by injecting an aqueous solution AUS32 into the system by that filtration equipment. So by means of doing this we can achieve 95 to 98 percent system efficiency as a whole. So why we are so much concerning from upgrading from BS4 to BS6 is because it is having that much impact. The problem of pollution is not only limited to certain areas, it is engulfed the whole country and we also know that 15 out of 20 most polluted cities in the world is only in India. So this is a major concern, right? If in case any conflict between health and wealth occurs, then obviously health is going to prevail. So for that, if we see in terms of this emission, it actually has lot of negative impacts such as it harms the respiratory tract and reduce the lung functions and it causes nose and eye irritation as well as it prevent the oxygen transfer. So these are the major threats by means of these harmful emissions. So what we have to do, we have to obviously switch over to some technologies or the fuels which is providing lesser uh, emissions of these kind of toxic matters. So if you see in this picture, if we upgrade to BS6, it can obviously bring down the emission level by 51 percentage, thereby in turn it reduces the particulate matter 2.5 and particulate matter 10 levels, which are the major health hazard emissions. So who have to do that actually, who have to upgrade this BS6 in the sense, the first one is the oil refineries, they have to supply the fuel types that match with this standard of BS6 and the second one is the automobile manufacturers who have who has to do that significant technological jump especially in diesel filter technology or in optimization of this selective catalytic reduction technology. So why still the industry is resisting to switch over in the sense because it needs a lot of money and the hardware parts of the automobiles have al also has to be changed and it is not an easy task. So this makes all these vehicles more expensive. So the next article is assessment of the resilience of terrestrial ecosystem to drought. Okay, So this is proposed by the Journal of Hydrology and what they suggested in that particular report is the increasing variations in the rainfall and the frequent drought and heat waves and the changes of evapotranspiration, these are all the factors which is affecting the hydrological balance of the environment which in turn affects the ecosystem productivity as a whole. So this article tells us about how each and every district in our country is resilient for the drought conditions. Okay, So what a resilient ecosystem means? the system which can observe the drought by increasing or maintaining its efficiency to use water to sustain its productivity. So if we see in terms of this definition, each and every district is different in terms of its resilience capacity. So from the journal, what they conclude here is they are giving some statistics like the 241 out of 634, that is 38 percent of the districts are resilient to drought, but 62 percent are non-resilient. And among that 62, nearly 30% are severely non-resilient districts. So totally only 10 out of 29 states and union territories are having more than 50% resilient capacity for the drought. So from all these statistics, they are coming to two major conclusions. One is the districts with predominant forest cover has better resilience than the cropland dominated districts. So how they are justifying it? is by saying that the forest dominated northeast and the north India are more resilient than the western part of India which is predominantly arid and semi-arid and some parts of the eastern states which are also non-resilient. And the second major conclusion is the districts with temperate climate is more resilient than the tropical and the dry climate. So in India 48% area is under the temperate climate and 30 percent is tropical and 20 percent is dry climate. So what the major exception here is, despite of the dense forest cover in the western guards, the Kerala is only having 19 percent resilient capacity and the Sikkim has 100 percent resilient capacity and Karnataka is even worse than Kerala. So why it is very low in Kerala or in the western guards in the sense, the solar radiation has much more controlling factor in the western guards. So the evapotranspiration is very higher in the western guards than in the other parts of the 
the country so that is why it is having very less resilient capacity but in south the tamil nadu is having more resilient capacity of 57 percentage to the drought conditions so these are some other states so the next article is the cabinet nod to panel on united nations sdg goals so what the news here is the union cabinet approved for the setting up of a high level steering committee which is chaired by chief statistician of india and the secretary of MOSP, which is the Ministry of Statistical and Program Implementation. So why this committee in the sense, its purpose is to check whether India was on track to achieve the U United Nations SDG goals. So we all knew about this MDG goals, which had eight goals and it acted as a blueprint for all the countries to pursue their national development strategies in a very sustainable manner. So what the major drawback here is the MDG goals were unevenly achieved across the countries. So in order to make it correct, now the government is trying to do this SDG goals. So these SDG goals have 17 goals and 169 targets. So its major uh, goals are like eliminate poverty, eliminate hunger and ensuring the quality of education to all and clean water and sanitation, etc. So this SDG goal is not a legally binding goal and it is just an obligation, for international obligation for all the countries to abide by. So in this picture, you can see all the SDG goals, right? So as a part of this SDG, the government is trying to do two things majorly. The first one is the fifth SDG goal, which is gender equality. And the ninth SDG goal, which talks about the industry, innovation and infrastructure. So in order to achieve these two SDG goals, the government is now doing two major things. One is the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs approved an increase in supervisory visit charges for the ASHA workers from 250 rupees to 300 rupees. So ASHA workers are accredited social health activists. So these ASHA workers are deployed at the grassroots level for the health services to the poor people as well as the rural people. And the second major step for the SDG 9 is the Union Cabinet approved the setting up of IIS which is the Indian Institute of Skills through the PPP model which is the private and public partnership model at selected locations based on the demand and the available infrastructure at that particular place. So why they are doing this is in order to achieve the global competitiveness of the key sectors by means of providing high quality skill training and applied research education for the youths as well as a direct and meaningful connection with the industries by means of collaborating with the industries. And it is also a kind of leveraging the advantages of the private sector enterprises as well as the public land. So they are making use of the public land for establishing the private sectors in order to enrich the youth's skills. And these SDGs are expected to bring changes in the lives of the people. So the conclusion here is the monitoring of the progress of such implementation of SDG will benefit the entire nation. So the next article is cabinet approves for the appointment of two things. One is the adjudicating authority and second one is the appellate tribunal. It is under PPBT Act, which is the prohibition of Benami Property Transaction Act 1988. So under this act, actually they prohibits the Benami transactions and provides for confiscating the Benami properties. So what this Benami transactions in the sense, it is like registering your property in others name in order to escape from paying the taxes. So whoever involved in these kind of Benami transactions, they shall be punishable with an imprisonment of three years or with a fine or with both. So this is the provision under this PPBT Act. So now they amended this act in order to include two things. One is this adjudicating authority and second one is the appellate tribunal. So what is the purpose of these two things is the adjudicating authority is a first stage reviewer and he is reviewing whether the administrative action under the PPBT Act is going fine or not. And the second one is the appellate tribunal and it is an appellate mechanism for which any order which is paused by this adjudicating authority, if it is not satisfied, they just can appeal to this appellate tribunal. So this, these are the purpose of these two bodies. Okay, And if you see here, the adjudicating authority is in Delhi and additional benches is in Kolkata, Mumbai and Chennai. And why they are doing all these things is for the effective and the better administration of these Benami cases, which is referred to the adjudicating authority as well as for the speedy disposal of these kind of cases. So the next article is creation of 
Fisheries and Aquaculture Infrastructure Development Fund, which is FIDF Fund. So this is by Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs and its estimated fund size is 7000 crores nearly. So what the purpose of this FIDF fund is to increase the investment activities of the fisheries sector. So, because if you see in this picture, the 90% of the small scale producers from the developing countries, they are dependent on the fisheries and nearly 12% of the world's population is also depend on the fisheries. So if you see the intensity, obviously we have to improve the investment in the fisheries sector. So this fund that is the 7500 crore fund is to be distributed to the beneficiaries by means of certain nodal agencies right so what are those nodal agencies which are going to distribute these funds are the nabar the ncdc which is the national cooperative development corporation and all the scheduled banks so these are all the nodal entities which are going to distribute these funds which means they are going to give certain concessional finance to the state government union territories cooperatives individuals as well as to the entrepreneurs so they are all the beneficiaries of this FIDF fund. So what are the benefits in the sense it create the fisheries infrastructure both in marine as well as in the inland fisheries sector and it increases the fish production to achieve our target of 15 million ton by 2020 and it also increases the employment opportunity to over 9.40 lakh and it also attract the private investment in creation and management of the fisheries infrastructure and the last one is the adoption of the newer technologies. So for all these, this FIDF fund is being utilized by these beneficiaries. So the next article is the memorandum of understanding among the BRICS nation. So first we have to know what this BRICS is. It is an association of five emerging economies and they are Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. So if you see in terms of population, nearly 40% of the global population are living in this BRICS countries and nearly 22% of the world's GDP is constituted only by these BRICS countries. So what the news here is, the Union Cabinet recently approved for the Memorandum of Understanding regarding the cooperation in the social and the labor sphere. So these five countries come together and they just signed one Memorandum of Understanding for this social and labor sphere, which means any labor who is migrating from one country to another country, he should be protected or he should be given his own rights in that particular country, right? So for that, and he should not be vulnerable in that particular country. And not only that perspective, he should also get the professional education, skills training and social protection wherever he goes. So for ensuring all these things only, this memorandum of understanding was signed among these BRICS countries. So this MOU is majorly emphasized on the mechanism of cooperation, collaboration and the synergy among the BRICS countries for ensuring the inclusive growth as well as for the shared prosperity in the industrial revolution. So this MOU is not an international treaty and it doesn't create any kind of obligations for the participants. But it ensured the networking of International Training Center of ILO with the BRICS network. So by means of doing this networking, it focuses on the theme of youth employment as well as the research on the new forms of employment. So the next article is Memorandum of Understanding among the BRICS nation for environmental cooperation. So this is for protection, preservation and sustainability of the environment. So the BRICS nation come together and sign this for this purpose and the latest technologies and the best practices which is suited for the better environmental protection should also be followed by all these countries. And it also facilitate the exchange of the experiences, best practices and technological know-how through both private as well as the public sectors by means of this MOU. So under this environmental cooperation, they are mainly targeting on the air quality, water quality and conservation of the biodiversity, tackling climate change as well as the waste management in an efficient way and for the implementation of 2030 agenda of SDG and the other area of cooperation which is agreed upon by all the BRICS participants. Okay, So now we are going to see the main articles. The first one is don't throttle the banking sector cleanup and the second one is why arms control is doomed to failure and the third one is plea seeking the gender neutral rape law filed in Supreme Court. And the fourth one is how to successfully set minimum wage in India. So the first mains article is don't throttle the banking sector cleanup. So this article is taken from the Mint. So this article talks about the PCA which is a prompt corrective action. So what this PCA is if any bank is not performing well or it is having more non-performing assets then it is automatically come under the ambit of this PCA. So what is the aim of this PCA is the financial health of any bank should be preserved and it is done only by means of this PCA. So these are all the 
thresholds which is fixed by the RBI to check whether any bank is coming under PCA or not. So the first one is CRAR which is the capital to risk weighed asset ratio which means if you are if any bank is having 100 rupees as its capital and in that 100 rupees nearly 90 rupees are under risk then it is more vulnerable that is it is it can easily fail but if that in that 100 rupees if it is having only 50 rupees as risk weighed then it is somewhat lesser vulnerable to any kind of fluctuations or failures so based on this criteria only rbi fixed some limitations like if you are having 9% of uh, CRAR, then you are coming under PCA and, you, and the PCA is now going to put many restrictions on that particular bank. But if it is 6% means then it is going to put some moderate restrictions and if it is 3% then it is going to put some lesser restrictions on the banks. So and the second one is NPA on the basis of NPA. If any bank is having NPA of 10 to 15 percentage then it is vulnerable and if it is more than 15 percentage it is even more vulnerable. So based on these criteria only the RBI is deciding whether any bank should come under this PCA or not. So if any bank is coming under this PCA then the restriction which is imposed on that particular bank is the one is no further branch expansion okay no branch expansion of that bank and the second one is no lending of heavy money to people or institutions okay no heavy money lending so why they are doing these restrictions in the sense in order to stabilize the bank first and in order to prevent further capital erosion from that particular bank this is what the purpose of this PCA so now we are going to see what are the benefits of this implementation of the PCA so the first one is it acts as a safeguard tool or a preventive measure if any other enforcement actions of any other agencies are getting delayed so it empowers the state banking regulator that is the RBI to close critically undercapitalized bank and it also provides a roadmap for doing such things and it also provides a 90 day closure provision in the PCA itself and the last benefit is it encourages the bank to keep more capital with itself so only it is coming out of the ambit of the PCA so it encourages the bank to have more money or capital to minimize the possibility of triggering the PCA for or against that particular bank. So now we are going to see what the news is that is the government is trying to dilute the PCA framework to enhance the lending capacity of the banks. So if you dilute that restriction then obviously the banks can lend more. So that is what the government is trying to do. So there are certain concerns for diluting that PCA. The first one is putting banks under the PCA framework is only helping the bank to get back on track as well as to ail the banking system itself. But if you dilute that, then obviously it is not achieved. This is the first concern. The second one is, and the RBI measures such as the asset quality review of a bank, the central repository and IBC based resolution framework. These are all the measures which helps us to understand the status of a particular bank. That is how much capital it has, how much risk weight asset it has. Everything is only coming out only by means of these measures. And after knowing all these things, we can take this prompt corrective action. But if you are going to dilute it, what is the purpose of all these things? so that is also a major concern and if you dilute it it would create a long-term problem for the banking system itself so these are all the concerns raised by the author so if you see in this picture these represent the gross non-performing assets for each and every bank okay so what they conclude here is the PCA framework actually helps to restore the financial health of the public sector banks as well as the private sector banks by means of limiting the deterioration of their health that is it prevents the further capital erosion as well as it helps to stabilize the bank right but if you try to dilute this PCA then it will result in the further weakening of the banks by means of further erosion of the capital from the banks okay so and also if any bank is getting accumulated by means of more non-performing asserts then obviously the taxpayer money is being utilized by the government for recapitalization of those PSBs. So th this is also a burden on the government as well as the Indian economy itself. So if you see in the past, the most of the balance sheet of the banks is being maintained only by means of the prompt corrective action framework. So don't dilute this. This is what they conclude here. And contraction in lending by the banks under PCA, if suppose any bank is coming under this PCA, then the further lending to the needy people or to the beneficiaries is provided by the healthier banks. So what we have to do is we have to better allocate the resources as well as to reduce the need for recapitalization of the PSBs in the long run only if you are not diluting this PCA. So what the way forward here is that is what the author concludes here is the dilution of the PCA 
is actually reversing the progress made so far by our economy and it will actually increases the actual long term cost of the economy and it is also seen as a failure in the part of the policy establishment in taking decisions so the prompt corrective action should not be diluted and it should be maintained as it is for having the better managed banks in our country so the next article is why arms control is doomed to failure so this article talks about the arms race which is happening between the developed countries and for in order to control that particular arms race between the countries they actually have signed lot of arms control treaty between those countries but in the long run they have not actually met what they are expected to and it is doomed to be a failure so that is what the news here so one such arms treaty is or arms control treaty is this inf which is the intermediate range nuclear force treaty and it was signed between us and russia in the year 1987 so according to that inf treaty what the provision is it actually prohibits the possession or produ production or the test flying of a ground launched nuclear cruise missiles with a range of 500 to 5500 kilometers so by means of banning this nuclear as well as the non nuclear missiles which is having short and medium ranges except the sea launched weapons this inf treaty is seemed to be ex enhancing the security of the united states as well as its allies but what the major concern here is the china is not under the ambit of this inf treaty it is signed only between us and russia so china is now producing this short and medium range nuclear missiles right so obviously it is a threat to the us countries as well as to the pacific countries so for example the dongfeng 26 which is made by china it is having a capacity to easily attack the pacific as well as the usa so see that much range the china's nuclear missile is having so what the news here is the usa is actually blaming russia that already russia is violating this inf treaty by means of producing this novator missile okay so by means of this they russia already have violated this inf treaty so after this they are actually blaming each other us and russia are blaming each other so it is continuing since the cold war right so the status quo which is the usa and the revisionist power which is the russia these two countries which are responsible for both the cold war as well as for violating this arms control promises they are only responsible for making it correct right but if you see in reality the greater powers like the developed countries like russia or the usa they always want to be the next super or global power and they want to maximize their share of power by means of investing more in these kind of uh, production of these kind of nuclear missiles and all so they never try to comply with these arm control agreements right so but usually arms control treaty is seen as a strategic stability and regime strengthening mechanism but it is not followed by any country that is what the author suggested here and if you see for example in the past the strong arms control measure which is the ctbt ctbt is comprehensive test ban treaty okay so this itself is being violated by all the countries okay so even itself is violated so the inf treaty is not that much powerful as the ctbt so obviously uh, by means of neglecting all these arms control so why the ctbt is not accepted or not followed by any countries is because they felt that accepting these kind of ctbt is not that much worth as well as it indicates the problems with the ideas of arm control itself so any country is not actually willing to abide by these kind of arm controls agreement so that is what the enter article suggest so the major powers like usa and russia they always view these arm control agreements as a by product of underlying political realities so it is a product of the political realities and it is not actually trying to constrain or giving the safety or security to any nation that is what they felt so using these kind of arm control measures actually the strategic autonomy of other countries are getting violated that means for example in case of nuclear non proliferation treaty the five major countries which are the part of the npt so actually by means of doing this they violate the strategic autonomy of the non nuclear states right so on the other hand china's rise is also alters the political contours of the global order so as the world is changing and the power dynamics of the entire world is changing this inf treaty violation by the us and russia is not that much relevant to the current context and it is also one of the casualty of such changing power dynamics this is what author suggested here so the next article is plea seeking gender neutral rape law filed in supreme court 
So a petition was filed in the Supreme Court for challenging the constitutional validity of the existing rape laws on the ground that it is actually not gender neutral law which means so if you see the section 375 of the IPC it actually defines what is rape and it only covers the instances of rape of a woman by a man so giving the legal protection only to women and leaving the transgenders and the man by means of this section 375 actually violates the article 14 15 and 21 of the Indian Constitution so the Law Commission of India and the Criminal Law Amendment Bill also proposed that the rape laws in our country should be made gender neutral and it should not be supportive only for the women by means of substituting the definition of rape with that of sexual assault. So the last article is how to successfully set a minimum wage in India. So what the news here is this wage code bill which is the code on wages 2017 it aims to set minimum wages for all the employees. And if you see, the central government will set the minimum wages for employees in railways and mines and the state government will set the minimum wages for all other employments. Okay, So why means in order to make some legal national wage floor in the sense some universal minimum wage. Okay, So it should be equal throughout the country. That is what the aim or purpose is. So what is the common misconception here is that is if you are increasing the minimum wage then it reduces the number of employment or number of jobs created in that particular economy. For example if a minimum wage is 100 rupees but now you are trying to increase it to 200 rupees then it is obviously going to decrease the number of jobs which is created in that economy. But it is not true and it is proved by means of this marginal revenue product. Which means, if you see in this graph, this point A, it represents the monopsony power, which means only one company is giving employment to all the people in that particular area. But if you see this point C, which is the competitive market, which means there are a lot of companies which is providing employment to that particular area. So it is only one company, it is more companies. But what the content here is, if you see in this point, the wage is very high and the labors are very low. So the number of labors is very low. But if you see in this competitive market, the wages are very low, but the labors are very high. There are a lot of labors in that particular area. So what the proposal here under this minimum wage code bill is, we have to fix certain minimum wage, which is above this minimum level and it is should below the maximum level. That is, it should be in between. So only it is not affecting our economy's growth as well as it is also not hampering the number of jobs creations in our country. Thank you.